I'll just introduce myself. I'm Sarah Vaya. I'm a professor and climate extension specialist at University of Maryland in College Park. And um, this is the fourth webinar we've had this summer. Uh, today I'll be talking about we need an epidemic of climate action. And if it's not obvious what that means yet, it will be. Um, we'll be talking about the tipping point and how the rate of change can be very surprising. In the welcome slide that was just on, I asked the question, what do these two pictures have in common? <laughs> well, other than being part of the same webinar, um, they both are dealing with the same process, which is a nonlinear process that can happen very fast. And I initially had um, meant to focus just on um, the behavior of trying to motivate climate change. But since we had a legislative development in the past um, couple of weeks, I wanted to add some additional information that I, I read and I thought was really interesting. So um, we'll just get started there. There's two parts of this talk. Um, let's go back to three weeks ago. I will tell you, and you already know this, I was pretty depressed three weeks ago. It just seemed like, you know, I knew we were not cutting emissions fast enough. Things are getting really tight. Climate impacts are escalating. Um, and it seemed like all we were getting uh, in our government was delay, obstruction, lobbying, nothing, a lot of nothingness happening. This um, graph shows you the global greenhouse gas emissions um, per year over a period of time going out to 2100. Historical emissions are here in black. And what these various lines and clouds show you are projections of um, what emissions will be in the future for current policies and actions, various targets, ple uh, pledges, wishes and hoping, and what we need to have in terms of emissions reductions to um, hold global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees C. Uh, we are, you know, here's, here's where we are right now, okay? We are far from this trajectory and um, people call that the emissions gap. It's an ambition gap and a motivation gap. And it's just like, we are not doing enough, okay? And um, that's pretty depressing because we don't wanna be up here. We wanna be down here in 2100. Um, then we had a miracle. <laughs> legislative miracle. I really think that pretty well describes it. NPR mentioned, uh, sort of described it like this, climate experts experience an odd sensation after the Manchin budget deal. Optimism. Yeah, well, right. We had not been optimistic for a really long time. And um, honestly, I prefer not to call it the Manchin budget deal because we would have had a budget deal before this. But anyway, Here's President Biden signing this um, legislation into law yesterday. Um, and it's the first serious climate legislation we have had in our country ever. And so this is just huge. And it is also giving me another word that I had forgotten how to spell, hope. This is really important. So I decided I want to talk to, to you about this a little bit today um, and, uh, and uh, sort of tie it in with some ideas that I think are pretty interesting. OK, the new law, which is called the Inflation Reduction Act, I will stumble over that, Inflation Reduction Act, will cut this emissions gap in half because it'll put us on a trajectory to get down here by 2030 to about mm, uh, 38 tons, um, excuse me, gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions per year, cutting the emissions gap in half. That is not everything, but that is a really good start. And um, I think, and this is what I found so interesting, I think that the investments from this legislation may make change a lot faster than we expect. And um, of course, that would be great if that happens. Um, Here's what's in the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm not going to talk about it in any detail. Here's what the spending is going to be on. Um, there's a lot of money in here for energy and climate programs, clean electricity um, in particular. 
um, a, a lot of incentives for building out the um, renewable power that we've talked about in a previous webinar, um, a lot of incentives for individuals um, to electrify their homes. Um, there are tax credits for clean manufacturing. This is super important. Clean fuel and vehicle tax credits, so more EVs, um, various other, other um, like uh, natural climate solutions here. Building efficiency, that's very important too, because the more efficient uh, buildings are, the less power we need. So that's great. And then there's some other good healthcare benefits. Um, and they're, they're raking in some money by um, um, sort of picking up on various taxes that they should have picked up before. It's interesting that they're going to increase tax enforcement um, uh, by $124 billion because they have pared down the IRS so much that people get, uh, and this is not people like us, people like us pay our taxes, you know, diligently every year. It's the people who make mega bucks who are not, you know, not paying their taxes because they have these smart lawyers. And so this is going to help gather some of these owed taxes, which is, you know, important. That's money that we need to, to have to spend on this program. Okay. Um, now, this is really the meat of the webinar. I want to describe how really important changes can occur much faster than we think, okay? So our perception is that everything is moving along at a more or less constant linear pace. So this is a cartoon I saw on the web I really liked. Here is progress over time. You know, here's some you know, person in their 20s. My life is so predictable, I'm never going to get anywhere because they are visualizing themselves, their progress increasing at a linear rate. So this is where this person thinks they're going to end up in the future. But, you know, time flies by, they grow up, they're, you know, 60 or 70, they're up here. I did not expect this. This is what they call the exponential growth surprise factor. It's what happens when actually things change in a curvilinear way, okay, not a linear way. And this turns out to be super important, both for the energy transition that I'll talk about and for um, changing people's behavior. So here's how it works. You think change is going to take forever, but it doesn't. And it doesn't because change usually doesn't occur on this linear, you know, in this linear way, plodding along as the guy was worried about, or the woman was worried about, often change in many kinds of processes occurs like this, in a curved way, it speeds up, okay? And um, this comes from a, a great article that was um, put out from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Here's the link, the links in the um, PDF handout I will send you of the slides will be hot, or if they're not, Sometimes people's PDF readers don't allow that. If they're not, you can always just copy it in. Um, so this article laid out a lot of really interesting things about how the S-curve is involved in the energy transition from fossil fuels to clean renewable energy that we, we discussed the need for this earlier um, in one of the earlier webinars. So the interesting thing about this is things really do start out slowly. You know, it takes the same amount of time to go from, this is this is market share, um, zero to 100%. So this is why it tapers off, okay? If it was just gigawatts of solar, it would just keep going up. But this is market share. It takes the same amount of time to go from less than 1% to 5% market share as it does to go from 5% to 50% because the system is traveling along a line like this not this. So let's just look at that in a little more detail. Um, if you're going along this line during that this time interval, um, if you're on the line, you you know you're only at 13% at this point. you know you increase a teeny little amount, the same amount you increased in the last time interval. If you're on the curve, then you get what we call the S curve surprise factor. Instead of 13% on the line, you're at 50%, okay? Because you've traveled up this way instead of plodding along down here. Now, an example of this, um, it, it can be seen in solar. And in 2010, the um, International Energy Agency predicted that in, tw in 2020, 10 years in the future, they would be installing, people would be installing about 12 gigawatts of solar. In fact, the actual installations were under 35 gigawatts, way more than they thought because the increase in installations of solar was traveling along a pathway like this. And we got the 
S-curve surprise factor, the nonlinear surprise factor. So this is big, okay? Um, what causes such rapid spread of new technology? Well, it, uh, it's described as the learning curve, which really is the, it describes the way that the cost of new technology drops with experience and the more it's used. So when a new technology is just starting, um, it costs a lot. But as it's used more and uh, manufacturers get used to making the stuff, et cetera, the cost drops. So um, this graph shows what's called the learning rate. The learning rate is how much does the price drop every time you double the number of installations. And this is not a linear scale. You see it goes from 0.5 now to one to two, up to 100, it's a log scale. And so because the learning curve is, is exponential, you get a straight line. And so um, this is actual data reported in our world in data, awesome site if you never go there, um, about the installation of solar and how much it cost per watt. Back in 1976, it cost $100 per watt. Um, and down here in 2019, it was costing, you know, a quarter of a cent per watt. Okay. That's huge. So there were some wiggles. It wasn't completely along this straight line on the linear, on the log scale. But over this period of time, from 1976 to 2019, the price of solar dropped 20% every time the number of installations doubled, okay? It, so every time, you know, there's twice as much solar out there, the price drops by 20%. This is huge. Um, over the whole interval, the price of solar modules declined by 99.6%. <laughs> I mean, from the point of view of 1976, they're practically free now. So the, um, the, um, the price drop per doubling is called the learning rate. And the learning rate for solar is 20.2%. Um, Every time it doubles, the price drops by 20.2%. Learning rate for wind is a little less, about 15%. Now, here's where the Inflation Reduction Act comes in. Um, there will be incentives for installing both wind and solar. Um, and this is going to further lower the costs, okay? That's gonna speed us down this learning curve and maybe even increase the learning rate because there'll be extra infusion of money. Um, and so um, there'll be you know, um, a, a bigger price drop than we expect just from market forces. The other thing that the legislation does is it, guarantees a 10 year time frame for the incentives to be doled out to um, solar and wind developers. This increases the predictability. And I read a couple of articles over the week um, of <laughs> by um, wind and solar expert people who say this is just really big because the way that the incentives have been in the past is they're sort of, you know, go for a few years, you can never count on them, you don't really know. And these things, these projects take a long time to develop. So the 10 year time frame is key. In addition, various rebates to homeowners for um, solar, um, as well as efficiency, et cetera, is gonna increase installations. The rebates for solar installation will increase the number of ins installations. And it's already been shown that when one house in a neighborhood installs solar on the roof, all of a sudden, a lot of other houses in the neighborhood start to install solar. It inspires the neighbors. And this winds up changing social norms because somebody sees those solar panels on your house. They go, yeah, they, they did that. I could do that. And then they put them on and then their neighborhood sort of goes. And it's, you know, again, it's a positive feedback and it changes social norms from the point of view of people saying, I think those solar panels look really ugly too. So that is so cool. Those people are getting all this free power for 25 years. So this is how things speed up. Now, what causes that exponential growth along the S curve? Okay, it's positive feedbacks. That is, the more something happens, it feeds back. It makes it happen even more. And um, one way that these positive feedbacks have been described um, with respect to installation of wind and solar is that we'll start here as prices fall. Okay, this is the learning rate. As prices fall, then the te technology becomes more competitive. Okay, um, costs less and less. 
becomes more favorable compared to the existing um, sources of energy from fossil fuels, demand increases, more deployment of solar or wind, prices fall, more competitive, more demand. This is positive feedback, okay? And that just rolls along up here, speeding things up. Now, again, because this goes from zero to 100, it tapers off um, because, you know, you can't get more than 100% of um, solar or wind installation. Um, in this uh, situation, there's a fairly formal, um, again, according to this um, article I read from the Rocky Mountain Institute, there is a fairly formal definition of a tipping point. And that is when the new technology is growing at an annual rate that is enough to cover the rise in demand. So let's say global energy demand is rising by 2% a year, okay? And um, when solar has enough new installations each year to cover that 2% increase in demand, that's the tipping point. That is essentially the beginning of the end for the old technology. And depending on what you know, how you read the data, we're either at the tipping point or pretty close to the tipping point where fossil fuels are going to peak out and there's going to be some death throes, but then they're, they're going to decline. This is all going to be speeded up by these um, investments from the Inflation Reduction Act. So it'll be this infusion of cash and certainty about the, the wind and solar technologies that's going to feed back and cause us to be on this very quick um, trajectory for um, installations. Okay. So here's the, you know, the actual data. This is now on a regular scale, not a log scale. 1975, um, price of solar per watt, $100. Here's that virtually exponential decline, right? Okay, in cost down to two, 215, you know, here's the cost. Um, and um, here's the trajectory of installations. This is global you know, hardly any, you know, in the 1990s, um, I, I put solar panels on my house in 2006, okay, but and I wasn't really even thinking about them then. In the 1990s or early 2000s, people who were thinking about solar are like, this is never going to pick up, you know, wow, come on, we need more work here, and then all of a sudden, boom, when the price got low enough, it took off. And it, it rose, the installations rose in this essentially exponential way, okay? Um, and so this is not now the fraction of energy made up by solar. This is just price per watt and number of installations. So this just keeps going up, up, up. Uh, wind, this on this axis is the cost, the level of cost of wind per megawatt hour. And you can see similar great decline in the cost of wind. Part of that, we don't have the wind installations here as we did for solar. What this shows is that part of that cost reduction is because the technology of wind is really improving. Um, back in the 80s, they had these, you know, 17 meter um, wind turbines. And, you know, that's not very tall, right? 17 meters times three is, is a certain number of feet. Now they're 150 meters. And the uh, the blades on those turbines are gigantic. They generate so much more power, okay? So a single turbine can generate way more power now than before, and that reduces the cost because you don't have to install so many. So that's part of what the learning curve has been in wind. But again, as the um, incentives come in from um, the Inflation Reduction Act, that's gonna lower these costs even more. That's gonna spur more installations. Okay, EV sales. Um, I couldn't find a very good picture of the decline of cost of EVs. Um, so the one I have ends in 2016, battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids both declined in cost. Here's a projection from Bloomberg um, about the um, uh, future growth of um, electric vehicles. It, it starts pretty much where this one leaves off. I'm sorry, I couldn't get something better, but whoa, exponential. This is on the S curve, right? There. They're um, uh, 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 in some almost exponential way increasing the sales of um, electric vehicles, which they think by 2040 will account for 35% of all vehicle sales. Some of the things I read have suggested that conventional vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles have already peaked 
and now they're going to start to decline as EVs become cheaper, better, you can go farther, people are more used to them, your neighbor gets one, you want one. Um, that's what causes this. Okay. Um, so the rapid spread of new technology because of the learning curve and the, and the nonlinear rate of deployment causes the demise of the old ways, in our case, fossil fuels, production of energy and um, um, transport. It causes the demise of the old to be inevitable. Okay, and so again, this is from um, uh, the second um, chapter of the um, RMI report: How past energy transitions foretell a quicker shift away from fossil fuels today. And here's that um, you know sort of demand increasing in the past. Fossil fuel demand reaches some peak, and we have probably already entered the plateau here, okay? The plateau can go on for some period of time, you know, demand for the old fuel goes up and down because of, you know, various things that the author of this article called shocks. Um, for example, the oil interests fight back. You know, they're not giving up, they're fighting back. They're fighting back hard and that slows down the transition. But um, this person described in a really interesting way how other factors like COVID, the, which dropped demand, the Ukraine war, which jacked up energy prices, um, more adoption over time, increases in efficiency, various incentives, these all speed things up. So I think we can expect the incentives from the um, Inflation Reduction Act to speed up this, you know, traveling across this plateau and uh, finally getting to the point where the use of the, the demand for fossil fuels not only declines, but goes off a cliff. And what we can see here is here's the new, they call it the challenger. Here's the new renewable energy, okay? Starting off at a low level. This is all qualitative, so we don't have a lot of um, you know numbers or anything in here. But by the time this reaches the peak, you can see that the um, deployment of the new technology, wind and solar, is still at a very low level, okay? That's the tipping point is in here somewhere. Um, and it really is inevitable that you're gonna get through this plateau and decline and go off the cliff. So I think the infusion of cash and certainty and um, the inevitable changes in social norms about renewable energy is going to speed up the demise of fossil fuel and get us through this plateau and <laughs> send them right down the cliff. After that, the oil interest can fight back, but really the market has you know already done it. It's already decided you're done, okay? And it's interesting that um, this person who wrote this article illustrated this dynamic that you can see very clearly in earlier energy transitions. I really like this one. This is the transition from gas light to electric light in the, uh, in the UK, okay? 1850, gas light. Okay, hardly any gas lights. Everybody gets gas lights, okay? Here's their, this the rising part of the S curve. Reaches a plateau around mm, between 1900 and 1920. It's on a plateau, but it's not increasing anymore. It's just, yeah, okay. And you can see down here at 1900, here comes the rise of electricity. Okay, that's contributing to this plateau. Finally, so many people have electric lights. Forget it. Nobody wants those gas lights. Boom. That's the, that's the downside, that decline and crash of the old technology. Here's the similar picture over not as many years coal heating to gas heating transition in the UK, okay? Here's coal heating, ever, you know, going along, using coal, using coal, using coal. Here's gas, okay? Low level, but before, you know, it doesn't have to rise very much before this one, boom, starts down. It's, it's already determined what's gonna happen by the time it gets to here. Um, you might not realize it. When you're in the middle of it, it's hard to realize it, but if you look back, I'll show you in a second. If you look back, you can see it, it actually was happening pretty fast. Coal power versus solar and wind power in the UK. So now we're up, to, you know, up to the present. Coal power, boom, going along. Everybody's, you know, using coal to generate electricity, um, and then solar and wind start to increase. Of course, gas is in here too, and that that confuses the picture a little bit. Natural gas, um, you know, like um, methane. 
Uh, and so here's solar and wind, hardly anything, hardly anything, hardly anything. I don't know what caused this. Increasing a little bit and then boom, so coal goes down and solar and wind start to go up. Coal versus solar and wind in the US, not quite, we haven't crossed yet, but coal has already peaked. Coal, the use of coal for power has already peaked and it's just on the decline. Solar and wind have increased, but they haven't really you know, started to do that exponent. I mean, they're on the exponential or the, the S-shaped curve, but they're still at the low end. You don't really see that rapid yet, yet um, on this scale. Anyway, but in all of these, the old technology starts to decline before the new technology has really um, spread to the point where people go, oh yeah, wind and solar, they're everything. You know, they might only be 5% here, okay? Um, very low percentage here of, of the, um, the uh, this is uh, coal to gas, very low percentage of the, of the heating is in gas in 1965, but coal is already done. So it's interesting that depending on how many years you're looking at, the peak can be hard to find when you're in the middle of it, okay? Here's global coal demand 2022 projected to 2025. Increasing and then eh, where's the peak? Are we at a peak? Is it gonna go up? This is forecast, right? Is it gonna you know, keep going like this? Is it gonna go back up? We don't really know. And so it's hard to see what where the peak is. Actually, the peak occurred around here um, in the US. He, if you look at global, I'm sorry, this is global. If you look at global coal demand from the 1800s, it increases really fast and peaks really fast and crashes really, this is forecast. It's already going down. The, the forecast is for a rapid crash in um, global coal demand because it's too expensive. It's cheaper to use wind and solar. And plus people are figuring out that fossil fuels are, you know, can really fluctuate a lot in costs. Um, I'm not gonna show you that slide, but electricity has remained about the same rate, same um, cost over time. Fossil fuels go up and down with every disaster. Okay, so let's just recap this part. Um, why the energy transition may happen faster than we expect, okay? I mean, most of us are sitting around being depressed that we're never gonna get off fossil fuels, but it might turn out to be quicker than we thought. So. Recap, changes in costs of renewable energy, electrification, and other key processes decline with increased use, that, that learning curve. Um, use increases on the S curve because of feedbacks, as I've described. Beyond the tipping point, the old technology is already doomed, okay? And then it's gonna go down off the cliff. Incentives like those from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act increase, this is a, a, not a very good grammar right here, increase cost decline. They speed up the decline of cost. And, they, and at, but in so doing, they speed up the energy transition. Now, Again, here's these shocks and stuff going on during the plateau, which can you know go on for longer or shorter depending on what's going on. It's caused by resistance from the you know entrenched interest and various political and weather shocks. Okay, so again, the infusion of money and attention from the new legislation, I think, is going to really speed this, it's going to jumpstart this process and get us on this rapid transition period, hopefully, so that fossil fuels start to go clearly off the cliff. Okay. The second part of this talk is about increasing citizen motivation for climate action. We really want a lot more people to be out there talking about, we need to change this, we need to fix this, and here's how we're going to do it. So one of the pieces of good news is that more people are starting to care. The Yale Climate Communication uh, people and the folks from George Mason Center for Climate Change Communication um, have been studying Americans for um, uh, since 2009. Um, and they have been asking them the same questions. Do you uh, think that climate change is occurring, et cetera. And based on people's responses to these questions, they um, divided Americans into six groups, which they call the global warming's six Americas. And they've been tracking the fraction of Americans in each one of these groups for a long time. I'll just show you the changes that have occurred between the average of 2017 and 21 and 
um, at the end of 2021. So this is not the total change that's happened. The six Americas range from alarmed, they have the highest belief in global warming, they're the most concerned and they are the most motivated. Concerned, they are pretty worried about it, okay? They, um, they're, you know, they think about it, they maybe are, are doing some things in their own homes. The cautious, well, we think this might be something, but I'm not gonna commit myself to doing anything. The disengaged, people who just got other things going on, they have no time to worry about it the doubtful and the dismissive, okay? It's surprising to most people that the number of the fraction of Americans who are outright dismissive, that is big time climate deniers, is low, 10%, and now it's only 9%. They get an awful lot of airtime, disproportionate amount of airtime for their representation in the public. When we get to 2021, we can see there's, these have remained about the same, but there seems to have been a conversion of these classes concerned and cautious to alarmed, okay? Um, so we now 33% of US public is alarmed, okay? The most motivated, the most concerned, that's a lot of people who are worried about it. 25% more are concerned. So overall 58% of Americans are worried about climate change and they want to see something happen. And I would recommend to any of you that you, you know, Google Global Warming Six Americas, you can track how this is going. These people have incredible reports every year tracking what people think, they, what they think about risk, what they think about, do they want their government to subsidize wind and solar, for example. Um, a lot of great information, but the good news is over half of all Americans want to do something about it. That's good news. And about half of these are doing something, maybe a little less than half. Okay, behavior can spread, speed up the spread of new technology. So let's look at the sale of smartphones. <laughs> In 2005, pretty much nobody had a smartphone. And this just lumps everything, iPhones, and, um, um, Android phones, et cetera. But you can see here it is, that S curve, okay? Smartphones just spread like mad, really in, in less than 10 years and pretty much saturating the market at this point, okay? How did that happen, okay? A lot of it was people got an iPhone. They're so excited about it. They tell their friends, I got this new iPhone. She tells two friends, each friend, I got a new iPhone, tells two friends. This one, two friends, I got a new iPhone, et cetera. Until before you know it, a boatload of people are like talking about iPhones, you're showing people their iPhones, they're all going down and, and this is Android phones, just smartphones. They're all going down and buying a smartphone. And you know this happened very, very fast. One reason this happened so fast is that Smartphones don't last very long, so people replace them fairly frequently, and you know they, they um, and they don't cost all that much, although they cost ridiculous amounts. Um, but it's not like replacing your heating and air conditioning system or something like that. You know, it costs a few hundred dollars, so it spreads really, really fast. This is a multiplicative process. I tell two people, they tell two people, they each tell two people. So it's two times two times two times two times two times two. Just increases multiplicity, multiplicatively. That's that, you know, very rapid sort of J shape. Um, now, does this look familiar to you? We're, you know, we've been in this COVID thing for a really long time. So pretty much everybody knows that diseases also spread multiplicatively, okay? If that previous picture that I modified to concern phones look familiar, it's because I modified this picture, which was about how viruses spread. Here's a first person coughs on two people, they get infected. Each one of them infects two people, each one of them infects two people, boom, you've got an epidemic. And epidemiologists have a lot studied the rates of transmission of diseases just a lot. And they have described, you know, um, sort of the degree of contagiousness, that is how transmissible different diseases are. And they describe the rate of that transmission with this term R0, or in Britain, they say R0, because that's what they call zero. R, we call it R0 in America. Huh? And R0 reflects 
on average, how many other people does one person infect? In this case, each person infects on average two people and on and on and on. Um, and different diseases um, are differentially transmiss transmissible. A hepatitis C on average, each person who has it is infected with it, infects two other people. Ebola, each one infects two other people. HIV on average infects four other people. All the way up here to measles, super transmissible. This is why we need to make sure people don't stop their measles vaccinations. Um, the average person with measles infects 18 other people, mumps, um, 10 other people, much more transmissible. The original COVID was down here between 1.4 and 2.4 infections per person. COVID Delta, 5.8. COVID Omicron, 7.0, more contagious, okay? So initially, each person infected around two other people. With Delta, each person infected 5.8, each person infected four. This speeds up the transmission of the disease through the population. And this is just a, a sort of lame picture of exponential growth. This is the number of cases. This is a picture I got off the internet. Um, initially, when you start out, uh, it, there's a few cases, but there's so, you know, so few people get infected because the cases are far apart and, you know, there's not many people that you think, oh, no problem. This is for an, a virus with R equals six. You think, no problem. Everybody was very complacent back there in February and March of 2020. And eh, this doesn't look that bad. But, whoa, then you see, in fact, it's on this exponential increase because of multiplicative spread. I spread it, they, you know, people I spread it to spread it. And when R zero equals six, that goes up really fast. If R equals 2.7, each person only infects 2.7 other people, it goes up slower, but it still goes up much faster than you expect. You know, down here, you're thinking, eh, this is nothing. Over here, whoa, this is something. In early stages of these epidemics, when it's growing really fast, it looks like that um, intermediate part of the S-curve. It goes up very, very quickly. So the more people each person infects, or if you're talking to other people about their behavior, affects the faster the change. Okay, so social change goes through this process, which is sort of like what I just told you about for spread of new technology. Um, initially, it's this number of people acting on climate change. Initially, you know, time is going on here. Um, just people are not really picking it up. Things aren't happening very fast. Everybody's disappointed, you know. Uh, I would say we're around here, okay? But then what happens is, because the process is on the S-curve, not on this line, like you thought, it's on the S-curve, you look away for a minute, okay? Same amount of time as this. Oh, you go over into this time period. Whoa, it's happening really fast. Amazement. So the phases of social change when it's controlled by sort of um, uh, contagious behavior, if you will, goes from disappointment to amazement. I am waiting for the amazement to kick in. As the um, behavior sort of starts to spread, eventually there's enough people doing it that it reaches a tipping point, okay? This is doesn't have a formal definition or I couldn't find one anyway so far. Maybe I'll find one by the next webinar. But it happens, I think, at least in part, when it becomes sort of clear that now things are starting to pick up the pace. They're going moving along faster than linear. That's a tipping point, okay? Um, and you know things are gonna take off because you're not on this trajectory anymore, you're on this one, okay? The tipping point. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should. Um, many of you have read or at least heard of the book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point. And there are tipping points in many things. There are tipping points in physical processes like the melting of the Antarctic, et cetera. Um, but this is a, um, uh, a lot of what he describes are tipping points in behavior. And that's what I'm, I'm going to be applying it to from now on. But in this book, Malcolm Gladwell says, the world of the tipping point is a place where the unexpected becomes expected, where radical change is more than a possibility it is a certainty. This is what we want, right? What can we do to deliberately start and control positive change of our own and get on that S-curve towards a tipping point where 
climate action will not be a possibility. It will be a certainty, okay? So what affects the tipping point for behaviors? This is from Malcolm Gladwell's book. He describes three things. The first one he calls the law of the few. Remember, this is occurring because I'm talking to someone and they're talking to someone and they're talking to someone, okay? Um, it is in that multiplicative um, uh, process. The law of the few, some people have an outsized social influence. The example he gives is, is um, um, Paul Revere. He had a very important social place in the pre-revolutionary colonies and people listened to him. You know, the British are coming, they listened to him. Um, people with large social networks, extra knowledge, persuasive manner, you know, somebody who's a really good salesman can uh, convince a lot of people whether or not what they're saying is true. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is happening now. Um, they are not the people with extra knowledge, um, but some people will have an outsized social influence. You have to recognize that. The stickiness of the message. It's important to get people to notice and remember what you are talking about, what you want them to do and why. Okay, so Slogans and, and catchphrases like Rosie the Riveter or the Victory Gardens, things with people associated with, with important change uh, during World War II. We can do it. People remember this and they want to contribute. Okay. We can do it. Yeah, I can do it. I can do it too. And the power of context. Behavior depends on the environment. Okay. For climate change, as the climate worsens, and we have seen a lot of, I think, escalating climate impacts this year the weather, the fires, the drought, the temperatures. Um, as this plays out, everyone will eventually get that something is happening, okay? More people will become alarmed. The more of your friends are worried about it, the more likely you'll be worried about it, okay? Um, and the, the thing is that people are, you know, social, right? They want to fit in to their social environment. And when people around them are concerned, okay, that changes what's called the social norm, what's normal. Um, <clears throat> right now, not many people talk to their friends and, and networks about climate change, but um, these social norms around climate change are already, you know, uh, building. It just doesn't seem like it. And um, I'll tell you later and next time how we can help with that. Okay, so when it comes to climate action and the R0, okay, what is the average number of person of people? So here it is, the, the number of people, oh, sorry, each person infects with the motivation for action. Sorry about that, just have each number of people that each person infects with the motivation for action. Uh, here's my picture again, here the R0 is two, but you know maybe some people on average um, infect or affect a lot of other people, okay? So, um, you can get on this, you know, this uh, sort of pathway. We want to, and I'm assuming since you're on this webinar that you are joining me here, we want to make climate action more contagious. That means we want more people to talk about it to more people, okay? And get them motivated to do something, okay? This, and, and we'll talk more about that in, uh, in the next webinar. So what? What's it gonna help if we have climate, if, if we had a bunch of individuals work, worked up about it. Well, it turns out this is a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy uh, in 2020 by um, um, uh, Dr. Otto, I've forgotten her first name. Um, here's resistance to change. Here's where we are. This is a little cartoon. And um, re resistance to change um, declines, but we are in this state here where there's like a peak beyond. This marble is not going to roll down because it has to go uphill and get past the powerful lobbies, the entrenched habits, et cetera, in order to get down here to a decarbonized state. She describes various interventions that are in some part instigated by people or people are involved in them um, as social tipping interventions. And they, you, these little weights, they pull down this resistance so that the, you know, the, um, world can move more readily toward a decarbonized state. This is all very qualitative, but um, what are those social tipping interventions? We don't need to go into detail into this picture. She articulated six arenas where she, th she thinks change is very important. Um, social norms, 
the educational system, human settlements, how we build our cities, the energy system, information, um, our, our companies disclosing their greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, financial markets. The paper addresses a few other things, but she doesn't work those into her model. I don't know why. Citizen involvement, which is what we're talking about, and climate policy, those things, all of these things feed back, okay? They all affect one another. So it's this little network of interactions and that's what speeds things up. According to Dr. Otto, these social tipping interventions can close that emission gap. Boom. Social tipping interventions, she thinks if we pull those, you know, if we really work on that and, and pull that off, we can keep the te global temperature increase below 1.5 degrees C. Um, last year, actually earlier this year, a uh, really important paper, qual uh, a sort of quanti quantitative modeling paper came out in Nature, one of the best science journals ever. Um, and these climate models show the explicitly show the power of behavior. Okay. Typical climate models, you know, they make projections. They say, well, if we continue with these, you know, uh, if things continue as they are, that is patterns of emissions from cars, et cetera, continue as they are, we're going to be here in 2100. They are based only on the physical world and the pattern of emissions. There's no behavior in there. Okay. So there's no, not, people aren't really doing anything except just kind of behaving badly and continuing to emit at, uh, greenhouse gases at high levels. These new models by Dr. Moore and her colleagues add social behavior and a variety of feedbacks between um, people and other factors, you know, governments and the physical world, et cetera. And um, she used accepted values for these different elements. It, uh, you don't want me to spell these out because it's really complicated, but there's too many things to look at. But she, she did this thing the way she was supposed to, so you, you can believe that. Um, she used accepted values and ran a model that she projected in the future using these elements with physical and social feedbacks and various reasonable um, levels of, of um, different elements. She ran the model 100,000 times, okay? It's a great thing about models. You can just run them a bunch of times and that sort of cancels out the noise and you get a picture of what's gonna happen. The results clustered into five classes, which look like this. This is global carbon emissions, um, gigatons of carbon per year. So this is what we want to reduce if we wanna keep the temperature low. Um, and she uh, produced a, a picture with five different curves. Let's talk about what, what those are. Um, the social feedbacks increase climate action and speed up emissions reduction. So in her models, there, you know, there wasn't regulation that said, now you have to cut your emissions. It was the social feedbacks that caused reduction of emissions. And here are the five classes of results she found. Um, so the outcomes, 28% of the times, the thickness of the line is how many of the 100,000 runs look like this. 28% of the times leads to a pretty good future, a fairly rapid reduction, not as fast as we need, but not too bad, a fairly rapid reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, leading us to around 1.8 degrees centigrade um, of temperature increase by 2100. Not as good as we need, but not too bad, pretty good future. 48% of the model runs led to okay progress, giving us 2.3 degrees centigrade. Again, not what we need, but a whole lot better than this, right? 2.3 degrees centigrade, almost half the model. So you take these two together, you, you know, most of the models lead to an okay result if you have social behavior. 22% of the models, um, that's this and this together, lead to a result that's sort of consistent with levels of what we're doing now. This is extra spurred by people's behavior and people, you know, bugging their legislators and talking to the people in their state government, et cetera. Um, uh, and um, okay, so here's the 2% is, this is do nothing. This is 2% a little bit better than do nothing. But if you do nothing, we're gonna be up here at 3.9 to 4.1 degrees centigrade global temperature increase. This is really hot. This is not gonna be good. We do not want to be there. Plants can't grow. There won't be any water, too many fires, too hot, not good. We want to be down here. So this is what where we're going. We want to figure out how to be down there. Who is going to start this epidemic of climate action? Okay. 
there have been some papers published on this, um, and it's really interesting. What, this table is from the same Dr. Otto that wrote the social tipping intervention paper. And other people are saying the same thing. Psychologists are saying the same thing, et cetera. It's the people with high levels of social power who can change others and affect policy. That's what Malcolm Gladwell said in the tipping point. What is What determines social power? It depends on a combination of your economic situation and this sort of nebulous social agency, how confident you are that you can make a contribution. Um, and Dr. Otto, this is global population. She basically, you know, uh, lays out categories of income. And this is the percentage of the global population um, uh, income wise. So this is the top 10%, 9.5 point plus 0.5, the top 10% of global people with global income. I didn't say that very well. People with in the top 10% of global income are in this box, okay? In the US, in order to get in this box, you need to make $75,000 a year, okay? Now, right off the bat, that should put most of us in a frame of tremendous gratitude because it, what we see here is that 90% of the world is not making this amount of money. So it has a standard of living that is not coming up to this. In case you haven't been grateful recently, this would be a nice time <laughs> to think about it. Um, the top one half percent makes 400,000 $400, a year or more. Okay, so the bottom of the top one half percent is four hundred thousand dollars, and then there's the billionaires and the zillionaires. Okay, the super rich. Okay, now this group here, the top nine point five percent that has incomes from seventy five thousand to four hundred thousand is responsible for thirty five percent of all global emissions. This one half of 1% of people adds another 13.6% of emissions. So this group, the top 10% of global income is responsible for almost half of global climate emissions, okay? These people also tend to have jobs, they maybe are involved in policy or whatever, they have very high or extremely high social agency. The super, super rich, maybe they're celebrities, they have, you know, Two trillion followers on, you know, Facebook or uh, Twitter or whatever. Um, they have very high social agency, and and they're responsible for a heck of a lot of climate emissions. Okay, so we talked in the webinar about economics. Who's going to pay for all these changes to fix climate change? Well, how about the people who? are causing a lot of the emissions. That was one of the categories that people causing a lot of the emissions should pay. Not only should they pay, but it would be really great if they would contribute to making this happen by engaging in climate action, talking about climate action, influencing, these are super influencers, influencing their networks for climate action. These are people we want to have acting. Um, and again, I would venture to guess that many people on this webinar are, you know, somewhere income-wise in this box. This is for a family of four, okay? $75,000 a year for a family of four. Um, so we can accelerate change by informing and mobilizing the people with high social influence. And after all, they are most responsible for the problem. I want to just bring this home a little bit. It's absolutely totally clear that carbon footprint, that is your greenhouse gas emissions of your home, your, your family unit increases with income. Here's a picture generated for Howard County, Maryland by two students in uh, 2021 who were in the Howard County Public School System Climate Change Institute for 10th graders. And I mentored their, their um, group uh, and got them interested in carbon footprints. And they came up with this graph showing that in Howard County, each one of these dots is the median household income um, for a zip code in Howard County uh, versus, this is their carbon footprint, the em emissions from their household per year. You can see a very nice line. Um, and it, you know, the lowest is, you know, maybe 35 um, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And it goes up to like 80. There are some counties in Montgomery County where it's up to 90 or above. And, um, so you see a nice correlation. People who have more money have more 
HVAC units in their houses. They have bigger houses. They have more cars. They drive more. They fly more. They emit more. Okay. And I'm not saying that people on this call are flying around in their private jets, right? Which is incredibly wasteful. Um, no, but even the lowest emitting zip code in Howard County is way above the global average emissions. Okay. Again, just in case you haven't been you know, reflecting on gratitude recently, the global average carbon emissions is 4.8 tons a year down here. This is so far above that, you know, 48 tons a year here, okay, lower end of Howard County is 10 times the global level, it's much more. So Americans have the highest per capita in emissions, emissions rise with income when we can, we can you know, use our privileged situation to make a difference. And again, no guilt trip here. This is just stating the facts. And, um, and I'm not saying you, know, you should feel really bad about you know, the fact that you run your dryer at night. I'm saying let's mobilize and do something about it. So social influencers are the people who show up they talk to other people, they make a difference, okay? They show up to events, they show up to things that they're in their in their city or county, they testify at various things, they vote, okay? Here are some people from Howard County showing up and um, making themselves heard. And social influencers, we, we would hope we can get them to also reduce their own carbon footprint insulating their houses and making their homes more efficient, changing to a plant-based diet, not wasting so much food. These are the things that individuals can do to um, reduce their um, household emissions. Don't fly so much. Flying is one of the biggest sources of carbon emissions. In other words, social influencers who are showing up and doing these things are people just like you, right? Just like you. And so what I wanna do in the rest, I only have one webinar left in this summer. What I want to do is to um, try to build on this a little bit. Um, so I'll ask you, what do you think your climate action R0 is? How many people can you infect with the motivation to do something, okay? You are here talking to somebody in your network. Let's talk about how we can stop climate change. Well, this person is like, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about that. Well, then you tell them, okay? And I have tried to provide information during the course of these webinars that you can use in these conversations. And it occurred to me recently that it might be helpful if I had a few fact sheets. <laughs> so, you know, when people ask you this, you could say, hey, well, it, it works like this. So I'm, I'm gonna work on these and hopefully we'll be trying to help you um, if you are interested in doing this because each of you can help turn Individual actions that you might do in your own home, hanging your clothes on the clothesline, getting solar panels, um, whatever, reducing food waste. You can help turn individual actions into a social movement for policy change. You can get us on that S curve, really just hurtling towards massive social action. So in the next webinar on September 7th, it's called Let's Talk About Climate Change. <laughs> I want to uh, provide some ways for you to make a difference in your own community and, you know, to sort of get involved and, and build up your climate R0. And we'll talk, a, I, I don't really know what I'm going to talk about yet, but in broad outline, we'll talk about what affects behavior change. What kind of ways do you address problems that will get people to change their behavior and not just want to go home and put their head under the pillow? We already know, for example, best practices in climate communication People need to have solutions, not just a description of the problem, okay? This is very important. If you give people, if you say, you know, go oh, when that Antarctic ice sh uh, shelf breaks off and sea level rises 20 feet, we're gonna be in trouble in Maryland. Uh, people are like, what? And they just can't listen anymore, right? But if you say, here's what we can do to make sure that doesn't happen, then people are able to listen. Um, I want to try to, uh, discuss some different ways to organize conversation with your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, your colleagues. Maybe organize some book clubs. I've got some great books that we could discuss. I, and I've already been working with um, someone in Howard County to um, develop some good questions for one of these books. 
we can have neighborhood meetings that talk about, you know, how do you reduce your own carbon footprint in your home and why is it important? You can talk to people in clubs you're in, garden clubs, or talk to people in your faith group. Just get people involved, organize discussions, and, um, and let people know this is interesting, it's timely, it's important, it's worth doing. Um, I know there are a lot of you out there because I've I asked you on the registration forms, um, what do you do and what are you interested in? Um, I know there are a lot of you out there who have done these community discussions and worked on community resilience, et cetera. If you happen to have experience in organizing or participating in community discussions, it would be so awesome if you would email me because I would like to learn from you. And in the next um, webinar, we'll have a little more discussion um, about what your experiences are and the kinds of things that you would like to see happen and information that you would like to have um, in order to be able to actually do this, you know, talk to people and get your climate action R0 <laughs> above one, <laughs> which is what it takes to spread. Um, and with that, I'm just going to end.